Um, thank you all for coming, and I would like to um, welcome Ed Martin, who is in charge of the learning and development function and acquisition and kind of uh, executive development at Pandora. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I appreciate the warm welcome. Thanks very much. Um, I, it's nice to have an invitation to talk to all of you. I, most of us at Pandora don't mind giving talks at all. We just feel so good about the place we're building there that you know we're happy to share it with people. So. Let me just give you a little uh, thing about Pandora. Pandora is, uh, the history of Pandora is that we actually started in the year 2000 as a company called Savage Beast. And Savage Beast actually made, uh, they, the, the genome project was the actual original uh, algorithm, quote, invention of the company. Uh, but what it was used for was kiosks in places like Best Buy, Target, Barnes and Noble. This is where, you probably remember it, you could take a CD, even packaged, scan the barcode, and then you could put headphones in and listen to different tracks. So that was basically Savage Beast running that, that algorithm or recommendation engine, as they called it. Um, and then about 2005, uh, a gentleman named, uh, and that was founded by Tim Westergren, by the way. So Tim is a former uh, rock musician, um, but had trouble getting his own music heard. So he was motivated a little bit by the need that artists have to be heard when they can't get a label. And um, it was Joe and, um, and Tim that decided they could potentially make a, uh, a radio station out of the algorithm, which was a recommendation engine. Right? I don't think they were sure at the moment exactly how that would work, but they kind of figured that you, you could make it happen. The same was true at Pixar when I was there. It, it really started um, as a special effects house uh, doing commercials. You probably remember uh, Listerine bottles going through the jungle and things like that. And, uh, Lifesavers that danced and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, those were early Pixar days. So, um, but John Lasseter believed that you could make a feature film, and eventually Toy Story happened. The rest is sort of history. So, um, so that was 2005, and then uh, let's see, 2011 they went public. So, when I started there two and a half years ago, uh, we had 300 people, and we now have uh, 1,200. And um, this year we're on track probably to be at about 1,600 before the end of the year. So it's growing really fast. So you can see the challenges right there with any culture you have, good, bad, or indifferent. It's going to be something different by the time you get to that size, especially when it happens that fast, because not everybody's going to, you know, uh, it, this is why hiring is so critical. And this is part of why we, we, we spend a lot of money on the hiring process, because getting the right people, good cultural fit, and so on is so critical. Um, we currently have about, oh, and by the way, we're at, so we have about 600 in Oakland, 600 people in Oakland, and, we pro and then the rest are in sales offices. They sell ad space. For those of you who listen to Pandora, you know that if you do the free service, there's ads just like on regular radio. The good news is we play less of them than broadcast. <laughs> it's still ads, but. Um, and they're in New York, Chicago, LA, uh, Detroit, Dallas, Atlanta, Portland. So. You know, it's, uh, that, that whole area is growing really fast. We have uh, currently around 76 million unique listeners every week. And, uh, you know, they are, um, they are an animated and emotional bunch. I mean, they love their radio and they love their Pandora. And when you design your own radio station, it is, you feel like it's your station. So things that don't work well on it, we expect to hear about it. But we embraced that almost since the beginning. Uh, listener support was one of the biggest organizations, is one of the biggest organizations we have. People answer phones live. They answer emails live. They do chats and tweets live. Uh, I don't remember how many are in that group now, but they all deal directly with listeners every single day. 80% um, of what they get uh, is actually positive stuff. Um, they read, for instance, at our company meetings every month, they read listener emails, um, a sampling, and um, you know, 20% of them are kind of, you know, complaint-oriented types of things. Uh, but the other 80% are, I swear, if you stood in our company meetings and listened to those emails, you'd, you'd be a mess. You'd be, you'd be, you'd be drenched in tears. <laughs> the stories, the personal stories that they write in emails about um, passing loved ones and first dates and I mean they get so emotional in these emails it's, it's fascinating and um, uh, we read them because you know in any company it's hard as you grow to keep the employee engaged with why they're there 
you know? And I think when you have that kind of business, it's a missed opportunity if you aren't engaging your employees with what you do. So, um, we have 76 um, million terrific listeners. I mean, we value all of them. Um, the last piece is principles, and the reason I put that up there is because Pandora has a set of principles, and these principles, I'll share a few samples with you, but, um, you know, they don't take the place of uh, vision, mission, and values, but they augment it in the sense that they were sort of the visceral, our first chance to viscerally attach people to what we do, why we do what we do. And those started up about five years ago. So about the time Joe and Tim got together and decided to do all this, that was one of the first things they did. They had an offsite with, I think there were six or seven of them at the time on the exec team. And they kind of talked through what Pandora stood for and what they wanted to be about. And so um, every month, uh, let's see, the second Monday and Tuesday of every month, we have a two-day program called Pandora University. And in Pandora University, uh, execs and other people in the company get up and give presentations to new hires in the last month um, about everything from how the genome works to how we sell ad space to why we have what the royalty situations are and why they're difficult. We have somebody trying to speak to the artist uh, relationships, listener relationships. <coughs> we don't do much with um, HR and finance. We keep that toned down. The rest of it is really about why they're there. And at that, Tim Westergren, our founder, um, used to be him and Joe, but Joe retired. So, but Tim um, always spends an hour and a half at the very end of every Pandora University only on the principles. That's all he talks about. And um, the rule around there basically is that if Tim, it, again, when Joe was there, if Tim or Joe, one or the other, couldn't be there to do it, we actually reschedule Pandora U. So it's not videotaped and shown as sort of a talking head thing. Um, it's always live. And you know, the most common question we get is, well, how's that gonna scale? Like you got 1,800 people, and or you're gonna be 1,800 people, and then you're gonna be 3,000, and uh, well, our plan is to still do it. Um, we plan to do what we do now. When you're a new employee in Atlanta, um, the first Monday or t second Monday or Tuesday following your hire date, travel arrangements are made for you, and you're flown to San Francisco, and you do this thing. Today, this week, we had Pandora University, there were six new hires from Australia and New Zealand in the program, right? So yeah, it's expensive, but it's also, that's your chance. That is your shot, you know? There are other ways to have a shot, but that's, one, that's our choice for how we want to do it. So um, the principles play a big, a big role in how we do. Um, these four lines here have to do with what has sort of informed my view of employee engagement over the years. And they go back quite a way. I'm a little uh, embarrassed, uh, actually, but uh, <laughs> uh, business school reunion. So I went to a reunion about, I went to San Jose State, and we had a reunion about five years after I graduated. Uh, and a guy I graduated with in business school there went to work for unions, and I went to work for a company in Palo Alto, high tech. And we were at the reunion together, and I said, hey, how's that? union thing going, because he went to be an organizer, right? which I applaud. I think he's very socially conscious, and I, we're still good friends to this day. But I said, how's the union thing going? He says, it's going really well, actually. I'm, you know, the income's really good, because I get paid based on people that join the union. But more importantly than that, it's just, it just uh, feels good to win elections. And I said, <laughs> so I said, well, why do people uh, vote for unions? He said, well, actually, they don't vote for unions. They vote against their managers. So when union drives happen, in his vernacular anyway, what they're really voting for is the stuff that their manager isn't doing for them. So they need a voice, and, and I think he's right to be in the union if, if that is part of the solution. Um, the goal of engagement, in my opinion, is to um, basically create a world others want to belong to. And you can, you can add, you can sort of, um, I guess you can attach this to almost anything. It could be uh, national, it could be a government situation, it could be families. In this case, it happens to be work. To what extent is the leader of the organization creating a world that those kids, that those people who have come to our country, those people who work for our company, to what extent have you created a world that they actually want to belong to, that they don't feel like they have to be there, they just feel like they'd rather be there. 
An example of that for me is at Pandora. Uh, one of our principles is we don't really care from where you work as long as it's okay with you, your coworkers, and it works for the company. So there's sort of three criteria, but we have a lot of people at Pandora, some of whom telecommute just because they don't have an office yet, but many of them will take one day a week or when they need to be home with six kids, six kids or whatever, they will work remotely. Well, what's interesting about it is this. Anybody in the company can do that, but virtually everybody in the company comes into the office. And the reason is because if you look at most uh, employee engagement surveys, many times in the top three, at least this has been true when I worked at Silicon Graphics and Xilinx and uh, Intuit and Pixar, if you look at the results of those surveys, the top three things that engaged people were, and the number one was the quality of the people I worked with. Because in the end, they got to get up out of bed and feel good about going in and spending time with these people, right? It's also the future potential of the company and having interesting work to do. Salary's all on the list, but it's usually fifth, sixth, somewhere further down, right? The number one thing, though, is quality of people that they work with. So creating a world others want to belong to means creating an environment and spending enough time on the hiring to make sure you're getting the kind of people other people want to be part of. So we spend a lot of time on that. We have a huge recruiting department. Yes, we have a huge recruiting department, but we have a three-person L&D team. You know? So there are trade-offs we make, right? But all of us agree on one thing in HR and in the company, that the quality of those people you first bring into the company make the difference. Because you can train people in skills, but you cannot train people to be kind by nature and to just generally uh, want to work, want to care. I believe, for example, when you talk about um, incentives. Um, you know, there are people that say, well, employee engagement is all about getting discretionary effort from people. I don't really buy that notion, and the reason is because I think if you build an incentive big enough, you can get somebody to give you the discretionary effort. If you make that bonus big enough, they'll yeah. do you the extra effort. What you can't pay them to do is care. Mm -hmm. You can't pay them to care about whether the people that work next to them are successful. You can't pay them to care whether the product satisfies customers. You know, how do you train in that? You, you just have to hire the best people that fit that mold and then create an environment they just want to be part of. The second one, well, I'll go back. So Dan Walker, I don't know if any of you know him, but Dan was the former VP of talent at Apple. So I produced a DVD on, on HR back in 2005, and Dan was one of the 11 senior HR people that I had join me in that. But um, one of the things Dan said in there was this. When the day comes that we treat employees as well as we treat our customers, that'll be a good day. Right? Because there's no way we're going to let customers get disengaged. We try to figure out way ahead of time if they are, you know, not feeling good about things. Why are they not coming back? Why are they leaving us to go to a competitor? We fall all over ourselves trying to make those things happen. We actually fall all over ourselves trying to prevent those things from happening. Not necessarily true with employee situations, right? So we made it a, a goal at Pandora to try and be, if there's one key word that I say, I would say describes our efforts at employee engagement, it's proactivity. Because we basically believe that you have to get out in front of what employees may be concerned about, what's bothering them, and so on and so forth. Because let's face it, it should be more valuable to be a current employee than somebody who's new or threatening to leave. Because they always get all the stuff. Right? The new person always gets wooed and, you know, higher on bonuses and all kinds, maybe even market rate, which might be a lot more than people who have stayed there for five or six years. So there's a bit of unfairness just in the raw piece of it, right? And then, of course, people who are leaving, you know, they're the ones that, they get, nothing wrong with them, everybody's got to take care of themselves, but people get an offer and they go, oh, I got this offer, well, you know, why are you leaving? Uh, well, I really want to be a director and, wow. They can come up with a director title so fast, you know, <laughs> to keep somebody. It's amazing to me. And so our view of it is you've got to get proactive about it. Identify who those people are. This sounds like old school HR, which is basically identify the talent. It's the other word for it. But the fact is not com many companies just don't do it that well. They wait till there's a problem, and then they try to fix it, and they go, why aren't we good? We responded. I'm sorry, but when you go to a hotel and you've got a problem in your room, yeah, you feel good they responded. You'd much rather it not be a problem in the first place, right? 
And it's sort of like birthday cards. Belated birthday cards are nice. <laughs> they really are. I mean, they do address that you remember. They're not as good as on the day, right? That card comes in the mail on your birthday, that's a different feeling than the belated one. Happy, you're still glad you got it, but it's a little different vibe. And then looking back, it's basically this. My, my family's Italian, they're from Sicily, and one of the, my, father, my grandfather was a, a tailor, and he had this sign on the wall of his, um, of his little shop there that said, with the child you were, be proud of the uh, adult you've become. So if you asked, if you could go back in time and ask that kid to look at your life, would they say, wow, that's the way I hoped it would turn out? Or would they be completely embarrassed by the whole process, right? <laughs> and this is the same thing we try to apply with our work with, at Pandora, because needless to say, with the principles and all the other things involved, we were a startup, and all startups are like this. They have aspirations about being a better place than they worked at when they were employees. And it just sometimes doesn't work out. So you have to keep asking yourself, are we becoming the kind of company that when we were a startup, we wanted to be? So um, part of engagement is a company that has some level of self-awareness about what it is as a company. I mean, if you, I'm, I've been amazed at what our recruiting team has done. I mean, really. I mean, when I got there at 300 people, I was amazed. I said to myself, gosh, these are some of the, these are some of the kindest people I've ever been around. I mean, in day-to-day -day hallway, there's just no ego or arrogance that I can see, you know. And I thought, what, when is that one jerk going to jump out from behind a door? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it just doesn't, it, 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 I swear, even to this day, I've been there three and a, uh, two and a half years, I still haven't met that person who is totally unreasonable, arrogant, blowhard, you know, it just, you know, it doesn't happen. And so that was at 300 people. So now we have 1,200 people. And I still believe that if you were to take the company as a collective and describe it as a person, so you say, what kind of company is Pandora? Well, if it were a person, you would have to describe it as a kind and gentle soul. He, here, there's a dark side to this, but I'll tell you the bright side. The bright side, of course, is that there are people you want to see every day because you know that when you go to solve problems, there won't be a lot of ego in the room. Somebody's trying to get to the right place. The bad news is they're so kind that in meetings sometimes where you actually need someone to be the naysayer, no one wants to do it, you know? It's like everybody goes, it, it works for me, you know, that kind of thing. And so you get a little bit of sort of, I'll go along, as opposed to, well, no, tell me what's bothering. So this is where the management piece comes in, is having managers well-trained in identifying and noticing when people just aren't engaged with the topic. In other words, the manager can see they have something on their mind but lets the meeting go and then ends and never says, you look like you're thinking something over there. You know, at least that says, I've been watching you and I feel like you have something you want to say, right? Because encouraging people that are uh, very kind is difficult sometimes because they want to stay kind. They don't want to be negative. So we're, we're working on it. As we, uh, one of our communication classes, we try to stress this concept of candid and kind, you know? Because, you know, I think it was Collins that said in uh, one of his books, um, maybe the degrade, I don't remember. He said there was something about the, uh, the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or, which is that people often believe you can only have one way or the other. It's got to be one way. I can either be honest uh, or I can be kind. You know? And we just believe that, nah, it's not really totally true. I mean, there are ways to be very direct and still preserve people's dignity and res be respectful and all that kind of thing. So we're just trying to get, we're trying to let our employees know it's okay you're very kind all the time. It's okay to say what's on your mind. Just don't do it in a way that abuses anybody. It's a simple message, but it's really hard for people sometimes who are just generally very kind people to get them to open up. So when you think about employee engagement, um, the bottom line to it is if you go to any orientation in almost any company, you don't have a room full of people that are sitting there you know, moping and, you know, they're not enthusiastic, they're not unmotivated, they're not unskilled or you wouldn't have hired them, they're not unkind, unoptimistic. They all come in with optimism and hope. It's kind of like babies coming into the world, you know, they're just full of, wow, this is cool, everything's new and interesting and I'm not sure what happens, you know, in many companies, it's just like, it, you wonder how, what will be the, where on the curve will they go, 
all right, the honeymoon's over. And, you know, you get that, that whole thing. So basically, with this, when they're in orientation, there's two hopes you get. One is that they will be charged up that they made the right decision. Because frankly, all through orientation, they're wondering to themselves, gee, I hope I made the right decision, right? And if you've got a very sort of unenergetic, unknowledgeable person in front of them, all right, if you'll sign this form, this, you know. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to think that that person's going to go, wow, this was worth leaving. All of a sudden, X anything start looking good, you know. I mean, this is, you really got to be careful of it. So, um, but the other thing is, there's, you, you really want to catch them and don't allow them to be disappointed when they walk out of orientation. That's, that's the one, the one place. So, so they, what they hope for is that they're going to continue to have challenging work, that they're going to continue to feel good about Pandora, that they're going to continue to get some personal growth. While the company's growing, nothing will disengage faster on two graphs than to see the company growing like a weed and personal growth just sort of stabilizing, right? Um, they hope that they're going to continue to work for talented colleagues, that you're not going to get on such a hiring binge that you don't care who you bring into the company, because someday they, real, they realize that they're no longer working with people that they really like. Uh, that there's going to be ongoing communication and ongoing recognition. And I was talking to someone earlier about this, that recognition isn't always about, you know, cash money and stuff like that. I mean, we have, we have this one guy, for example, I was telling someone earlier that oh, this one guy has on the shelf behind his desk, he has rows of race car models, you know, F Formula One, all this kind of stuff. You know, and... If his manager goes up to him and says, wow, that was a really good job. I think you really put a lot of energy in that. You took the extra hours. Here's two tickets to Marine World. You know, you start thinking to yourself, okay, not, I mean, it's recognition, but is it a missed opportunity to say, I actually, you're more than just the person that plugs those holes for us. You actually are somebody that I know, and I know you like race cars, so here's one to whatever the raceway is up near Napa, Cheryl. So, there you go. Yeah, one of those raceways. So, um, yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, so NASCAR and all that's a little <laughs> removed from me. But, um, so, so recognition many times is about more about manager self-awareness than it is about bonus systems and all that kind of stuff. I mean, when I talk to people who are leaving the company and we do exits, I, I, over the years I've been a voracious collector of exit interview information. Just, it just, I'm fascinated. Um, and especially the dire need for the process to get better. Because unfortunately, if you ask, well, you know, why is, you know, why is uh, Vinny leaving? <laughs> you know, well, uh, better opportunity. Oh, really? That's what you want me to put on the form? Better opportunity? Uh, let me ask you this. Why was Vinny looking in the first place? Oh, she was looking for a better opportunity. And why was she looking for a better opportunity? Because she didn't get any here. Bingo! <laughs> you know, let's just keep narrowing this down until we get to the right place. These exit interviews, no one ever let, you know, and I'm fascinated. I love companies that do all this really cool stuff. Believe me, I'm not against any company that wants to have, you know, private gardens and, uh, you know, well, you know the list. I don't need to go through it. I'm not against any of those things. But if anybody really believes that that engages and keeps employees, they're really just, they're walking in their sleep. No one ever said in an exit interview, you know, those burritos were just not free enough. <laughs> just not free enough. What they leave for is you can't get a decision made around here, right? Can't get a decision made. It's too, it's, you know, I, I'm trying to, I spend half my time trying to get, do my time off on that stupid time card you guys have in the system, you know. They, they leave for, because they can't get their job done, because the company isn't helping them get the things done they need to get done, in addition to the social stuff and everything else. But the fact of the matter is, more people leave because the company has made it hard for them to feel a part of things. I didn't get any recognition. All these kinds of things. Those are not about free anything. Those are about being aware and taking care of, the, of things. Uh, so we risk disengagement when people lose access and when they see risks and limitations to all these kinds of, kinds of things. So the way we kind of look at it is uh, that engagement is a balance. It's like anything else in life, it's a balance. 
And we don't think it's just about what we call the heart side. And it's not just about the mind side, but there are two parts to engaging employees. On the left, we have basically what we call heart, which is, uh, so one of these is executive accessibility and priority. Well, it's very important to Tim, to uh, Brian, who's now our new CEO, uh, Tom Conrad, the chief technical officer. It's important to all these people that our employees get access to them and can talk to them and not have to go through layers of executive assistance and all the other kinds of stuff. For example, this is something Tim did when we were 300 people and he still does it today. About once a week, he sends an email out to all of Oakland, so that's 600 people. It says, it basically says, I'm going to lunch in 10 minutes, I'll take the first 15 people. And they meet him at, I'll meet you at the front door. When the 15 are up, he sends an email out, I got my 15, I'm moving on. You can do that same thing in a variety of ways. It is, um, you know, we're going to do focus groups. Um, we're going to eat one lunch with the CEO. How many times have you heard that one? You won lunch with the founder. You know, you've done such a great job. So what Tim does is basically something he just likes to do, which is he likes to engage with listeners and he likes to engage with employees. Right? So they still do that, 1,200 people. He claims he'll do it until the day he leaves there um, because it's spontaneous um, and it opens the door to anything they want to talk about and it's done over a meal. It's very casual. Um, I already talked to Pandora principles. Uh, when I talk about environment, I'm talking about creating a space in which people feel their own presence. So what I mean by that is we chose to do that with a picture wall. You'll see pictures of it in a minute. But the picture wall um, is basically a, a two walls that are covered in magnetic paint. And the pictures are done by, we have a, a woman at the company who's a photographer. So when they go through Pandora U, the first day before they go to lunch, they line up, basically, and she takes their pictures in front of a back backstop and all that stuff. But anyway, those are put on magnets, rubberized magnets, and they're put up on the wall, and they are every employee in the company. So there are 1,200 magnets on these two walls. Um, we talked about kiosks. We thought, well, it's a high-tech age. We could just you know, do a code, and their pictures could scroll across. But you know, that isn't the same experience that happens when 5, 10, 15 on any given day. I still sit near it and I see people stop and look at all the pictures. One, they're learning who each other are. But two, when the CEO sent the note out, he didn't say, oh, we put a picture wall up so that you can find each other better. What he said was, we put a picture wall up to, to celebrate how important the people are who make this radio station, right? So every time we bring visitors, vendors, employees through, what we're trying to impress is this is not done by computers. These people design software. These people play music. These people analyze music. These people sell ad space. But every face there means something. So that's part of what I mean by environment. And you know, again, I'll go back to a Theros. We didn't have a magnetized wall with everybody's pictures on them. We did at Pixar, but at a Theros, we didn't have that. But we, what we did have was we had pictures of employees at all stages of their work and play all over the building. There was no hallway you could walk down at that semiconductor chip company that didn't show real pictures of real people having fun with each other, doing their jobs, and every day they walked by they were reminded that the company believes they play a role in how successful the company is. It's just one. It's not the only way. You, you have to supplement it with other things. But first and foremost, people have to feel they mean something to somebody. Um, Pandora you I already mentioned. Giving Back um, is a, a group. Oh, thanks. Uh, is a group that reports to me or reported to me, and um, we knew we wanted to do more in the community, but we just didn't have money to write checks and do philanthropy yet. Our goal someday is to have a foundation and the whole thing, but you have to have aspirations. But what we're perfectly capable of doing right now is ensuring that all of our employees feel um, uh, entitled and able to go out and volunteer. So we give them one week of paid volunteer time off. And we want them to use it. Uh, we don't penalize them if they don't. But we tr and what we do is our, the, the woman named Karina Otrakova who works for me, or worked for me, she's now in Marta's group. But what Karina does is she searches out the opportunities 
and makes them available to employees to say, here's something going on in the Oakland schools, here's something going on in these homeless shelters, so on and so forth, where you know, sometimes they band together with groups and go down there, sometimes they do it individually, but they can charge it to that. And they don't have to feel like, oh, I shouldn't be taken away from my job, because the company is saying to them, we expect you to take away from your job, it's just, but that's how we're choosing to spend the money rather than a philanthropic thing for now. Transparency is basically about the fact that you know, we try to be, you know, barring SEC rules and things that you always have to be mindful of, we try to be as honest with everybody as possible. The PERGs are Pandora Employee Resource Groups. Many companies have these. These are special interest groups. We give them $1,000 a year to spend on their PERG, and we've got some wild PERGs. <laughs> wild PERGs, right? You always go, well, what? Why would you ever spend a thousand bucks on that weird perk? Well, we do it because we, start, we, we started perks because we wanted employees to get together socially. We didn't care. We don't care if it's knitting, we don't care if it's skiing, we don't care if it's volleyball, we'll making hand puppets, we don't really care, you know? <laughs> what, what we care about is that they are spending time together socially in addition to where, being at work. Because we feel like the more they like each other, and the more they find things about each other that they can choose to like besides the way they see them work, the more engaged they'll be with each other. And we just still believe in it. And so now when a PERG becomes a very serious contender, it goes over to the, you, I guess I, it's arbitrary, but we, this one here, Women in Business. Women in Business started as a PERG. It got $1,000 a year to bring in speakers and things like that. It's now a full-blown piece of our business. We have, it has a large budget all to itself, right? Because it's a PERG making a difference. We have some diversity PERGs that are right behind it that are probably gonna get funded for, to have their own budget. Um, so PERGs are a very important part of, of being at uh, Pandora. So on the right side, so that's all the hard stuff. This is stuff that feels right, right? And the right side is the mind stuff, which is that we believe You've got to have, each, we, you don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be visible to people, but you, we, we try to have processes for communication. Like we try to hold senior level managers accountable for making sure that people in their organization hear things that they're supposed to hear. Um, proactive pay management, I already talked about that, making sure that you get to employees before they come to you. Uh, enabling processes, uh, looking at things like our time, uh, payroll system, uh, accounts payable system for doing expense reports, these kinds of things. How hard do they make it for an employee to get their job done and still have to worry, figure that thing out, you know, that whole thing? So um, uh, learning as an investment, you know, they have invested in the learning there. Uh, recognition tools, uh, something like that is on the list because it's an aspiration of ours. One of the visions we have is that in all of our locations you would have electronic, uh, you know the things at Times Square, like the, you read the news? <laughs> that we would have those along the ceiling in all of our offices around the country and world. And, if, and we believe heavily in peer recognition as opposed to management recognition. And um, that if you were sitting in your desk in Chicago and you had a good experience with someone in Oakland or another thing, you could type in a tweet length type of recognition shout out and hit it and it would scroll in every office um, you know, for some period of time. Um, that's, our view is that the more public you can make the recognition, the better, but not in your face. Like, like we care enough about this that we have a woman in HR that reports to the VP of HR named Marta Riggins. Marta is the VP, uh, she's the senior director right now, but um, Marta is in charge of employee experience. So that's different than just culture. It's different than party planning. She actually was recruited from our marketing department. So she works on candidate experience and employee experience. So her job is to ensure that, as I said earlier, that our employees and our candidates have the same kind of experience customers and clients have and listeners have. Right. Oh, well, so before I do that, um, when people ask, well, how do you know they're engaged? I mean, it's nice for you to get up and give talks, but how do you know they're engaged? Well, we know it from a couple of ways. First of all, the climate survey that we do uh, has about 30 questions, five years in a row now. So when we have 300 people, and this year we just did it 1,200 people, 
we get a 92% response rate. A couple of them are still references. I don't think it's those two. But anyway, so stuff happens. Anyway. Um, we can blame Cheryl. It was well, a link that did not too many. 93%. So we still, so we have, so uh, 97 percent still, you know, rated us high in everything, right? Now, you know, you can, you can maybe get that when you're 300 people. I'm not sure you can get it when you're 1,200 people. It still stays high. And I think part of the reason is we have people that are just so passionate about Pandora, even if the score were low, they would still participate because they want to talk about Pandora, right? So you can give them a chance to, they're going to. Um, other one is we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Everybody that I've hired in, um, so far in learning and development, so far most of the people that work in, um, or at least some of the people that work in the business partners are all certified coaches. So they've all been through a one-year thing through NLP Institute, Coaching University, or whatever they call it. Uh, you know, the one in San Francisco, New Ventures. But they've all been through some kind of an advanced program on coaching. And we ask them to be coaches to any employee that wants coaching time. So we don't just do it with the execs, we do it with anybody that wants coaching time. Um, but they tell us in the coaching sessions what they think about Pandora. And that's why, that's one area. So the survey tells us what they think of Pandora and why they're engaged. One-on-one -on -one coaching sessions tell us. Uh, listeners actually tell the listener support people, your, your people we deal with every day on your, on your radio station just seem to love what they do. So we measure that a little bit, like they don't come on the phone mopey or anything else. We know, we know from our listeners that they like the people they deal with. Uh, hallway engagement, most of us have been in this room, we've been in HR long enough, you don't have to walk too far down a hallway and you can sort of get the vibe of what's going on with one person or another. Um, we get feedback from managers. Over almost 50, over, I think it may be, actually maybe about 51 or 52 percent of all employees at Pandora were referred by another employee. So we have 1,200 people. That means over 600 people that work there were brought there by another employee. If you hate a place, you might invite your worst friend, but you know it's probably not going to be people you really like if you don't like it there yourself. So we, we, we believe that that has something to do with the engagement of the people, is that they will invite other people to be there. We get, when we do training classes, we ask people about their feelings about Pandora, what are some of the things that keep, continue to keep them engaged. I did focus groups when I got there. So we had 300, I think it's 317 people at the time. I did focus groups with over 300. So I don't know, we didn't get quite to the 317, but pretty close. Um, and then the founder lunches. They tell Tim you know, what works, what doesn't work. So we have a pretty good sense of whether our people are lying to us or whether they really like it there. And I already talked about that promoter score, which basically we just take the top two, add them together, bottom two, add them together, divide them, and this number at the end is sort of gives you the idea on trends year to year. You can see whether that net promoter score goes up or down. So what are the key factors in engagement at Pandora? Um, we have an insatiable desire for the best talent we can find. So we will not hire someone, if, even if they're fabulous, but we perceive them to be a management challenge. Believe me, everything I'm showing you tonight isn't 100% perfection. We manage these things every day. So we have issues. Not everything's perfect. But one of the things we do tell managers is your job is dependent on making sure that the people we've given you to manage have a good experience, right? Again, some are better than others, but we have employee champions. There, Marta was one of those. Marta was one of those working in marketing who was always out carrying the flag in the hallway. I mean, she's a big believer. And she's done, she's done uh, field trips to places like Zappos and Google and Facebook and Twitter and all the others. And she still believes that while we don't have a lot of money to spend on stuff, what we do have to spend, we spend really, really well. And we make sure that people are, are having as good an experience as they can. So our view of this is every company has people. Every company has some history. Every company has customs, the way they've done things, has a unique legacy. That company started someplace. That company started with some mission, something they believed in. It's back to the thing I said earlier. Some, every company has some value that their product has or they go broke trying to sell it. Somebody needs it. And we believe that in, in engagement has a lot to do with how do you throw a spotlight on each of those areas of your, of your company. As I said, you can go 
looking at it, I'll, I think I've got time to show you one. But this is the bottom line is, back to that statement. Would the startup you were be proud of the company you've become? And the things you would do when you were small are the same things you've got to do when they're big. You can't just say, well, now we're big. We can't afford all that sort of fluffy stuff. Hey, if you afforded it at 300, you better figure a way to afford it. It's an investment. It's not money you're throwing away. But again, we don't believe everything has to do with money. We believe a lot of it is the processes people experience, the level of a, a proactive engagement that managers have with their people, and those kinds of things. And those don't cost you anything. It may cost you a little more money to hire the best managers you can, but it won't cost you money in terms of just throwing dollars at, at things. Oh. I guess that's the end of that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, hopefully you found some use in the run. Um, I'm trying to catch a plane uh, for a family thing. So um, what, but what questions can I answer? Because uh, presentation is a one-way thing. So what kind of? Oh, you have all this information on how you know employees are engaged. But if you were to just walk into a company and you walk down the hallway of Congress, what would you, how would, uh, what do you, how would you know that employees are engaged? What could you see? Well, I wouldn't know it at large, but I will say I think I do what a lot of people do. Um, maybe I'm hypersensitive about things, but I swear when I go into even the lobbies and receptions, I, right away I decide whether I, how much further I want to go with interviews. I, I probably still go through them, but I, there's a part of me that's already turned off when I get to that first door. But when they're taking me down the hallway, first of all, do they take me down the hallway and put me in a conference room and I never see another part of the company? Or does someone on the interview say, let me show you around a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just the immediate area. You know, something to express that we're proud of this place, right? Um, I listen to people talking in their cubes. These people have closed offices anymore, so you can hear people talking in their cubes. I look at whether or not they're actually, they seem to like each other. I know it's fuzzy and arbitrary, but the fact is you can tell, in my mind, you can tell when people like being around each other and when they just assume pass, you know? <laughs> so I don't have an official or scientific way to do it, but I think all of us have a visceral red flag about something doesn't feel right, you know? Now, if I were doing it as a consultant, you know, you usually you have processes, right? You go around and ask questions and all that kind of stuff. But I think unless you have the trust of certain people, you're not really going to get the total picture. Because uh, just asking questions is also going to get you people who are just negative by nature, and that's not the whole picture. I mean, no company's a, I mean, I shouldn't say no company's a totally horrible place. There probably are a few. But, <laughs> but, but most companies are a balance of having some dark side and some bright side. That's just like, they're, they're all human beings, and that just happens to be how we all are, right? There's just a little bit of everything, so we're complex. <coughs> I'm not sure if you oversee training and development of the uh, of the tech uh, the, the tech um, crew. Mm -hmm. Yes, is the rest of the IT folks. Mm -hmm. But what's your take on uh, training offered to IT personnel or you know the, the tech or the engineers as a form of employee retention? Well. Um you know, it's a weird irony in all of that. Uh, first of all, I mean, we, no, we don't handle that. Each, those are functional trainings, and so they all happen within the groups. I find that Pandora is an amazing IT department, and I think that they encourage their people to get out and do training, but the irony is, I've never, you know, you talk to any systems analyst, they barely have time to breathe, you know? And so I think that they're, they're encouraged to do that, and the company will pay for them to get that, but many of them won't take the time to do it. They're just so, again, this is the dark side of passion. You know, people will work themselves to death. So when I say a manager has to be self-aware, you got to be aware that someone's burning out. You can't wait for them to come to you and go, I can't even think straight. You know, you should be noticing. No, I think I'm talking to the choir there on that one. But go ahead, Eddie. Speaking of uh, segues here um, uh, for training and, and uh, training managers, uh, is there patience for like a one-day or two-day training? How, how long are your programs and are they mandatory? That's a great question. I mean, I, I could take any one of the seven classes that I personally do, uh, and I could make them two and three days, but um, it's just not the environment we're in. I mean, part of it's the age group. I mean, over, uh, let's see, just over 50% over of our people are under 40, and mm -hmm. over 40-some percent are under 30. So it's a young population. And they, they, they need things to happen quickly. I don't make it happen so quickly that I just go, well, you need it quickly so you don't need as much. I just try and find creative ways to get them what they need. But get it. So we're looking at mobile learning you know, on the phone. Uh, we, use, we partner with lynda.com so they can do things online. We use mindtools.com for rapid learning so they can go as shallow or as deep as they want. 
Sure. So I have a question from somebody online. Um, you had talked about transparent communication. And how do you get everybody in the company to adopt this mindset? Um, well, first of all, you've got to have to do it through role modeling. I don't think you can just tell people to do it. The fact of the matter is Tim and Joe, John Trimble, our revenue officer, they all are, are very good about answering questions directly and being as honest as they can and not break any, you know, SOX rules and stuff. I mean, obviously, you want to be legal first above all. And, um, and then ethics goes right along with it. It, it seems like there would be, uh, I'm curious if you think there's a priority uh, you talk about so many things that you do, right, that, that you guys are doing from photos of the employees mm -hmm. to, um, you know, how you hire and, and pay. Right. Uh, I work with an organization I think is, you know, having so much trouble. Things like photos would be seen, some of these things sound like they come later when people are feeling a little better, more engaged, more connected. If people are feeling pretty disengaged, where do you start or how do you decide where to start? Because oh, what? Yeah, you... a lunch with the CEO doesn't actually feel like a good idea in this organization. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yes, know that anybody can handle it. I think it's the greatest, it's a cool idea. And I'm like, boy, that's cool. But now I'm thinking, where do you start? Well, you know, when I got there in, um, when I got there two and a half years ago, it had the 92% rating and all that stuff. But when I did focus groups, and that's why I love focus groups. One, I want, it's a, way, a great way to meet people when you're new in an organization, so I love focus groups. But focus groups also give you the raw stuff. You know, surveys, I mean, I think they answered them honestly. They, they love Pandora. But so I think the thing that told me a lot was that in those sessions, they were basically saying, we love Pandora, but. And so it isn't like they hate the company. They just think it could be better. And I think we're like that with our kids and everybody else, too. It's like when you see what the, it could be, it's like when you see that in an employee, you owe it to them to try and help them get better. When you see it in a company, you deserve, it's important to give them feedback because maybe they don't realize that it's getting this bad. In those cases, when we did the focus groups, there literally were some areas of the company that needed some attention. And we got up in front of employees and said, look, some things we'll fix right away, some things are going to take a little longer, and some things we won't change because, frankly, they're just not the things we're going to change in this company, right? And um, uh, that's the transparency thing again. And you just got to be honest with it. You know, you, you know, we talked about it today, setting up committees and all the action items that come out of surveys, inevitably most of them fail because it's hard to get committees committed and sticking with things until they get closure, right? So I don't have a direct answer for that. I think things were somewhat broken when I first got to Pandora, uh, not to anybody's demise, but just not as good as they could be. Um, but I personally think, yeah, we didn't put the pictures up for like three years. Uh, or not, that can't be, I'm only there two and a half years. So it was probably a year, year and a half. But that, that came as sort of just in the process of doing other things. We didn't like, oh, we're going to put everybody's pictures up now and everybody will feel good about Pandora. We did that as just part of other things we were doing. But we didn't do it without Tim doing a lot of lunches and finding, getting to the core of what some of the issues were. And... Tim's great at just listening. You know, he doesn't try to defend. He doesn't try to tell, tell people they're wrong. He just listens, right? And I think that goes a long way. And then the rest of us work on the, the street part. I'm going to take a couple of more. I, I, sorry about a plane departure, but I'm going to have to go do it. But let me take a couple more. Yeah. Uh, I asked a little earlier, but you remember just to finish, um, the diversity efforts mm -hmm. within your company, how does that integrate? You said that you started to well, it hasn't integrated at all. We just hired, um, well, I think an offer is going out this week to our first diversity officer and she, who will work in HR. And um, she'll build an organization around her uh, to work on this. But it's not about numbers, really, for us. It's about making sure that there is, uh, you know, really good equal access to all the things we do in a community that's incredibly diverse, right? So we're very self-conscious about the fact that we've got a lot of work to do in that area. And nobody's apologizing for it. It's just the way it went. And, and it's a dark side of a very nice thing, which is employee referral. You know? Now, the good news is it's a multicultural society, so that doesn't mean that friends can't be of different backgrounds. So there's still nothing wrong with employee referral. But when you see it having a uh, disparate effect, because it's, you know, you've got to do something about that. So we're working on those things. You know? I just, we're not a broken company, but we have areas, pockets, that we still, you know, they give us headaches. We still take Advil. Just like, anybody, just like anybody else.